so now we will talk about the uh, separation of uh, lease and uh, and uh, non lease uh, component so among the many things which we have listed uh, we're going to talk each one of them uh, one by one and uh, we will also try and understand some of them with the help of look at lease and non lease uh, as i said contracts do contain the right to use multiple underlying assets building equipment uh, multiple pieces of equipment right uh, the right to use each asset because remember it has to be an identified asset which has physically distinct right uh, a separate lease component any other resources that are readily available to the lessee okay and the underlying asset is neither highly dependent on nor highly interrelated with the other underlying asset in the contract so in a way that the the asset for it to be classified as a physically distinct and identified has to be such that it you know you can generate economic benefit independent of the other asset so if it's a power plant you can't say that the belt uh, you know which is um, let's say transporting coal uh, to the to the plant itself that's not an asset in itself right uh, it's all in the, it's all very closely integrated so you, you can't benefit uh, from that component of your own so uh, unlike an example of a building where the floor is independent of the other floors even though you may have some common lifts right uh, or you may have um, uh, common wiring and so on and so forth but in a way the floor is is, is still substantively is possible to use it um, you know without uh, uh, being influenced uh, how you use other floors uh, from from that perspective so so we have to we have to look at uh, can the can i can uh, use the asset okay of its own and then um, i need to look at um, uh, you know item that contribute to securing the output of the asset or lease component right so so let's just let's just read through this slide so many contract contains a lease right uh, coupled with an agreement to purchase or sell other goods or service like the non lease component talked about like the maintenance right only item that contribute to securing the output of the asset right securing the output of the asset are lease component others are non lease component for example a supplier may lease a truck and also operate the lease asset on behalf of the customer operate means i'm going to provide a driver and i'm going to provide the fuel and like provide a driver the service which is driver is not related to securing the use of the truck in this example only the use of the truck is considered a lease component if i'm charging anything for providing the services right that's a non lease component that's how we're trying to distinguish between the lease and the non lease so what you are going to pay only for the asset right identified asset that is a lease component everything else is a non lease component please remember that now similarly cost incurred by a supplier to provide maintenance on an underlying asset as well as the material and supplies consumed as a result of the use of the asset are also non lease in a way they are not lease component okay the non lease components are identified and accounted for separately from the lease component in accordance with other standards so you got to look at the other standard and accordingly you will appropriately you need to account for it uh, for example the non lease component may be accounted for as an executory arrangement by lessee or you have an accounting policy choice right and i'm going to talk about it that um, uh, you have an accounting policy choice and you may decide not to separate them as well and account them together as well so just kind of expanding on that um, so under nds 116 uh, payment for maintenance activities including common area maintenance and other goods or services transfer to the lessee are considered non lease component because they provide the lessee with a service they are not essential to the use of the asset itself right they are non lease under india's 116 such costs are not separate component of the contract because they do not represent payment for goods or services and are considered to be part of the total consideration that is allocated to the separately identifiable component of the contract that is lease and non lease component if any in a way so they are not separate component they are to the one and then you got to allocate them what is lease and what is non lease and it goes into uh, you know to to basically um, uh, you know how do you allocate fair value to the maintenance how do you allocate fair value to the lease and so on and so forth and we'll try and also help you understand 
um, with the with the help of the uh, example, uh, you know, in terms of your ability to identify and separate the lease component and non-lease component in a contract with the help of an example. Okay, so entity L. Uh, rents an office building okay entity l rents an office building from landlord m for a term of 10 years okay what is the term here 10 years the so again there is a identified asset this is a contract and there is a term uh, and there is a rental uh, stipulates that office is fully furnished and has a newly installed and tailored hvac system it also requires landlord m to perform all common area maintenance during the term of the arrangement. Entity L makes single monthly rental payment and does not pay for the maintenance separately. So I does I'm not paying for the maintenance separately, but I'm getting the maintenance services. So there is a lease component and there is a non lease component. The office building has a useful life of 40 years and HVAC system and the office furniture each has a life of 15 years. So building has a life of 40 years and HVAC and furniture has a life of 15 years, right? Now, the, what are the unit of accounts in the lease, right? So I have taken the building which comes along with the HVAC system um, and also it's a furnished uh, office uh, and then I'm also getting the maintenance, right? And then um, I make one lump sum uh, kind of payment. Uh, so, so what are the different components, okay? So now when you look at there are... Um, Multiple components, the three component, the building asset, the office building and the HVAC, the office furniture um, and the maintenance. The office and the HVAC are, are considered as one um, because uh, they cannot function independent of each other. You can't separate them just like that. The HVAC system was designed and tailored specifically to be integrated into the office building and cannot be removed and used in another building without incurring substantial cost. Okay. Now, the furniture, of course, can be moved, uh, can be used on its own. It's also a lease component, a group of distinct assets for which L can, for which L in a way directs the use. The maintenance uh, we've been talking uh, is an agreement, uh, non-lease component because it is contract for services and not for the use of a specified asset. Okay, so there are three uh, components um, in a way in this arrangement. Okay, three components, right? the building asset, the office furniture, and the maintenance agreement, uh, in a way, from that perspective, one, two, and three, right? Okay. So moving forward uh, to talk about uh, some other uh, examples, right? Or other, other nuances uh, from a standard perspective. So using the practical experience, I talked about this briefly, that there is an accounting policy choice um, that uh, you may decide not to separate the non-lease component. So there is a, a practical expedient uh, which is provided in the standard. So in DS116 provides a practical expedient that permits lessee to make an accounting policy election by class of underlying asset to account for each separate lease component of a contract and any associated non-lease component as a single lease component is one, right? As a single lease component. So you're getting a policy choice here, not to separate them. It is important to note that such practical experience is not permissible for lessor. It's only permissible for lessee. Now, this, has, this could have many connotations, right? If you make this policy choice, it can have a significant impact on your balance sheet. It can also have an impact on, on your PL, uh, how some of these expenses are presented, how, because, you know, if maintenance, for example, if you treat them as non lease component and, um, and then it will be accounted for as an executory contract, what does that mean? That you will account for on a month on month basis as you keep on paying it. But if it is actually considered as part of the lease arrangement in itself and you decide not to separate them and let's say the contract is for five years, then the maintenance cost also in a way gets capitalized as part of the ROU asset and the liability. And we will talk a little bit more uh, about this, right? Uh, so making this election, why we'll make this election? It relieves the lessee of the obligation to perform a pricing allocation, although it will increase the total lease liability to be recorded in its balance sheet. The expedient is not available for lessor. Lessees that make the policy election to account for each separate lease component of a contract 
and any associated non-lease component as a single lease component allocate all of the contract consideration to the lease component. So you don't make this distinction, right? You then you don't make this distinction from uh, your accounting, reporting, presentation perspective, though you may have to make some disclosures that you have decided to include a uh, non-lease component also as part of lease component by opting for this tactical expedient, okay? Now, if you were to uh, look at allocating, you say, no, I don't want to combine them. I want to allocate them, identify them, okay? So the lessee allocate consideration in the contract to the lease and the non-lease component, to the both the lease and the non-lease component uh, on a relative standalone fair value, relative standalone price basis, okay? On a relative standalone price basis, uh, lessees are required to use observable standalone prices, prices at which a customer would purchase a component of a contract separately uh, when readily available. Um, if observable standalone prices are not readily available, uh, lessee estimate standalone selling prices, maximize the use of observable information. Uh, lessee apply in DS-115 revenue uh, contract with customers. Uh, to allocate consideration in the contract between the lease and the non-lease. Remember the, the India S115 principle that, uh, uh, let's say, if you have a, the combined value as uh, 100, whereas uh, the independent fair value is, uh, for example, 90 uh, plus 15, uh, this 15, uh, the, so this 5 uh, discount, in a way, gets allocated to 90 and to 15, um, in a way, in a, in a relative um, a fair value method and and um, you know uh, that's a standard methodology that's a standard methodology and uh, and we will talk uh, with the help of an example um, as well right um, uh, to help you understand uh, how this needs to be applied okay uh, so moving forward um, in terms of how this needs to be applied all right so now we will talk about this example uh, which is which is giving us a perspective as to how do you allocate the lease and the non-lease component, right? So uh, in this example, uh, the lessee enters into uh, the lease of an equipment. Uh, the contract stipulates the lessor will perform maintenance as well. So, right. Uh, so there's an equipment here and, uh, uh, you know, and, and then uh, there is a, uh, maintenance, uh, the lessor will perform maintenance of the equipment and receive consideration, okay? And the stated price is 80,000 and 10,000 for the lease and for the maintenance, the total ups to 90,000. Now the standalone prices cannot be readily observed. So the lessee makes estimates, uh, maximizing the use of the observable information of the lease and the non-lease component as follows. Lease is 85,000 and maintenance is 15,000, which is 100,000. So in a way, I'm offering how much percentage of discount if you look at it, right? Uh, I'm offering a discount of 10%, right? I'm offering a discount of 10%. So the question here is that um, assuming lessee has not opted the practical expedient, practical expedient, we talked about that, right? Uh, which is uh, that if you decide not to separate them and, and take them as one component. Now, assuming you've not decided, uh, you've decided uh, to separate them and not to combine them, right? Not to treat them as one single component. Then uh, how will the lessee allocate the consideration to uh, the lease and the non-lease uh, component, right? So essentially to put it very simply, since you're allocating 10% discount, right? On 85,000, you're going to allocate 10% discount. On 15,000, you're going to allocate 10% discount and you will be able to get the uh, you know, value which is allocable to the lease and to the non-lease. In uh, you, and you can do it the other way around as well, right? Which is the standalone price of the lease component in a way represent eighty-five percent of hundred thousand. Uh, you know, uh, and the balance uh, in a way fifteen uh, percent of for the uh, maintenance. Uh, so uh, the lessee allocate uh, the ninety thousand. Uh, what you allocate end up is thirteen thousand five hundred, which is eighty-five percent of ninety thousand. Uh, goes to your uh, 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 lease uh, or and the and the for maintenance uh, it is uh, thirteen thousand or you can do as I said other way also 
uh, on 85,000, you and, and you can apply a 10% discount, right? And that will also get, get you to 76,500. Similarly, on 15,000, uh, you apply a 10% discount that will also get you to 13,500, which will total up to 90,000 uh, in a way uh, from, from that perspective, okay? That's similar to the uh, relative uh, uh, standalone uh, prices, uh, which you need to then determine. Uh, once you have the observable data, uh, which is uh, 85,000 and 15,000 in this example, then you know the total discount, uh, which I have offered to the customer, the discount you allocate uh, to the fair value to determine you. In a way, the most important thing for you to remember that you ignore the stated price in the contract. The stated price in the contract was 80,000 and 10,000. That's not relevant. What's relevant is how much is the total, uh, what was my total contract consideration, which is 90,000. That's uh, one number which is uh, uh, sacrosanct because that's the total cash flow which you will get. And then the other number is then I have the fair value data or the observable data, which is 85,000 and uh, 15,000. That means the total, if I, would have sold, if I would have sold them individually, I would have generated what? 100,000. Now I'm getting 90,000. I'm offering a 10% discount. The discount gets allocated to both of them. Uh, you know, in proportion to their selling price. So on 85,000, you allocate 10%, on 15,000, you allocate another 10% and you get to 90,000. Okay. Now let's talk about contract combinations. Okay. Now contract combinations, uh, uh, we've been again, uh, been talking about this. That's not new for us. Um, contract combination is when you're signing multiple contract at or about the same time with the same counterparty. Uh, the idea is that are you trying to, um, uh, you know, achieve an outcome which otherwise wouldn't be possible if you would have signed it together, right? So in a way, again, you try and look at the substance over form, right? And, and you try and see whether I need to look at all these independent contracts together uh, or they are, they are good to be looked at independent of its own. So that assessment is required. That Do I need to combine them? Do I don't need to combine them, right? So... Uh, two or more contracts entered into at or near the same time with the same counterparty are considered a single contract if one or more of the following criteria are met. They are considered the same contract if one or more of the following criteria are met. The contracts are negotiated as a package with an overall commercial objective that cannot be understood without considering the contracts together, right? The contracts are negotiated as a package with an overall commercial objective that cannot be understood without considering the contract together. So that means the economic substance that they are meant to be together, right? The amount of consideration to be paid in one contract depends on the price or performance of the other contract, okay? The rights to use the underlying asset conveyed in the contract from, from a single lease uh, component uh, in a way from, from that perspective. Again, as a practical expedient, an entity may apply India's 116 to a portfolio of lease with similar characteristics if the entity reasonably expect that the effect on the financial statement of applying this standard to that portfolio would not differ materially from applying it to individual asset within the portfolio. What happens that many times, let's say, uh, you know, when you're trying to make all of this assessment of the lease term of the, uh, uh, you know, of the fair value or, or, or you know, uh, what's the discount rate and so on and so forth, you try and then you may be able to do it to the portfolio assets, you know, as well. Like if I'm leasing 100 uh, uh, computers at the same time or 100 motor vehicles and so on and so forth, right? Um, entity to use estimate that reflect the size and composition of the uh, portfolio uh, if I were to account for this in using a portfolio. Pro. So remember, you know, from a contract combination perspective, the key is that if you are trying to defeat uh, the accounting outcome by signing multiple contracts, that will not help. So we are guided by the substance of the arrangement that are these contracts looking together makes economic sense uh, from the, uh, you know, the customer as well as the supplier perspective or the service provider perspective uh, or the lessor and the lessee perspective. And hence, we need to look at all of them uh, in a way together, right? Uh, so that's where you look at the contract combination. Now we're going to talk about the, what's the uh, nuance around the inception and commencement. So we've already talked about, uh, you know, how do I, 
uh, separate the lease and the non lease i have a practical expedient not to separate them then i talked about the contract combination i also talked about a portfolio approach uh, which again is available as a practical expedient uh, and then now talk about the um, uh, nuance between the inception and the commencement of the lease okay so um, inception of the lease uh, is defined as the earlier of the following date the date of the lease agreement or the date of commitment by the parties to principal terms and condition of the lease when it talks about the commencement of the lease uh, commencement date is the date on which a lesser makes an underlying asset available for use by a lessee so let's say i have signed the contract today that's the inception but i i don't have the possession of the buildings i have a flat so you sign the agreement today and the agreement says it will start uh, you will get the possession on 1st of december right so then that becomes the lease commencement okay the underlying asset is an asset that is the subject of a lease for which the right to use the asset has been provided by lesser to a lessee so uh inception is the date uh, the earlier or the date of commitment where i know the terms and condition the commencement date is the date when the asset is available for use by a lessee in certain cases the commencement date of the lease may be before the date stipulated in the lease agreement okay what happens in some scenario you get the possession you start working on it but actually the rent period starts after you've done uh initial fit outs and things like that okay when the this often occurs when the lease space is modified by the lessee prior to commencing operation the lease space like during the period less use the lease space to construct its own leasehold improvement okay again we see this many times let's say you're trying to lease out an office space and uh, now you've got a bare shell uh, for you to use this bare shell uh, you need to do some leasehold improvement right you need to build you got to get your furniture you got to move uh, you got to get some uh, you know um, a uh, lot of things uh, in a way installed right uh, for you to start using it uh, that's the fit out period or that's the leasehold improvement period um, and and many times uh, this is what is called as rent holiday period right um, so some of those things are important uh, in a way for you to understand that um, that whether the asset uh, is it can be used for the for the purpose it is designed to be used right and that in a way helps you to determine the uh, accounting uh, you know from from that perspective so uh, what's the relevance uh, of inception date uh, is the date when an entity shall assess if the contract is or contains lease uh, the determination of whether or not a contract is a lease or contains a lease is done at the inception date is the date of the contract essentially is the date of the contract now the relevance of the commencement date uh, is the date from where you start accruing the accounting charge right uh, if a lease takes possession or given control uh, over the use of the underlying asset before it begins operations or making lease payment under the terms of the lease the lease term has commenced even if the lessee is not required to pay rent or the lease arrangement say the lease commencement date is the later so i think the important thing is the lessee takes possession of or is given control over the use of the underlying asset before it begins operations or making lease payment under the term of the lease the lease term has commenced already that means you will start uh, you know recording the cost right even though the agreement says that you only pay after 6 months that doesn't matter okay even if the lessee is not required to pay rent or the lease arrangement states the lease commencement date is a lease. so again you go by the substance of the arrangement right you go by the, if i am in possession of the property i've started using it i've started getting the fit outs done uh, you know the, for my my purpose the lease commencement date has been achieved okay while the commencement date is relevant because on that date a lessee initially recognizes a lease liability and the related right of use asset on the commencement date a lesser initially recognizes its net investment in the lease on the uh, commencement date uh, in a way from that perspective okay so the importance of the inception is the contract date inception is a contract date on which you make an assessment that whether it's a lease or not a lease and commencement date is in a way date when you actually accrue account for the uh, right of use asset liability from a lessor perspective and start possibly also accruing uh, the accounting charge uh, from an amortization perspective in your pnl okay so now we will move forward and um, uh, we will talk about uh, lease term okay 
least term is is again the most important uh, uh, one of the most important uh, thing so so we, among many things we've already discussed uh, lease and non lease component uh, right um, uh, and then we talked about the uh, the contract uh, combination uh, right um, and uh, and then we talked about the uh, lease inception and the commencement date and the relevance of the same um, and uh, we picked up, of course, a uh, few examples uh, along the way. And now let's just talk about, um, you know, what is the meaning of lease term? Lease term is the summation of the following, right? What all goes inside the lease term is the non-cancellable period, period in which you are not supposed to cancel the lease. If you were to cancel, that means there is going to be a significant disincentive or a penalty which will be levied to you, right? So, which includes a period covered by the option to terminate the lease if only a lessor has right to terminate a lease. From a lessee perspective, you are not allowed. Periods covered by an option to extend the lease if the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise the option. Period covered by an option to terminate the lease if the lessee is reasonably certain not to exercise that option. Okay. The assessment of whether it is reasonably certain that a lessee will exercise an extension or termination option should be done at lease commencement date. Okay, so the lease commencement date, not at inception date. So lease inception, you are making an evaluation that the con contract contains a lease arrangement or not. Now, what is the lease term? Is when actually you are doing the accounting, right? On the date when you are recording the right of use asset and liability and that is done on the lease commencement date many times the lease inception and the commencement may coincide as well right uh, but if in scenarios where they don't uh, these dates become very very important for you to do an appropriate analysis all right so what all goes inside the lease term non cancellable period and in a way uh, there are uh, renewal options uh, you know where uh, I am reasonably certain uh, to exercise that option, period term option to terminate the lease if the lessee is reasonably certain not to exercise that option. So you also factor in the renewal options. It's not only the non-cancellable period, but also the renewal options. So uh, the assessment should not be based solely on the lessee intention, past practices or estimate, it should focus on factors that create an economic incentive for lessee, including contract-based, asset-based or market-based factor. Uh, what are the factors I'm going to look at? The contract-based, asset-based or in a way market-based factors. Um, and some more examples, um, lease rentals uh, in optional period exam example uh, termination penalties and you know a specialized asset a variable or contingent rate uh, or terms and condition after initial optional period example purchase options all of that you know contract based asset based or market factor all these factors you know uh, you need to you need to look at in a way for you to make an assessment of the lease term it's a it's a judgment right uh, which you exercise and um, and again, you got to exercise this judgment cautiously, right? So, because this judgment has an important um, impact, financial impact, from a balance sheet perspective, from a PNL perspective, right? Because the longer the lease term, the higher the right of use asset and liability. The shorter the lease term, the lower the right of use asset and liability on the balance sheet. And 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 again, the PNL impact will vary depending upon the size of the asset and liability. Uh, from a financial statement uh, perspective. So is that discounting, all of that is actually goes hand in hand with what is your assessment of the lease term. Many times these are, these are again, simple to assess that the, let's say the life of the asset is five years and you leased it for five years, right? Then it is five years, right? But let's say you build, you leased a building and you say my non-cancellable period is three years and then I'm going to, I have a right to renew after three years, uh, first renewal right, and then I have a second renewal right uh, the lessor uh, cannot terminate uh, during nine year period, but I can terminate after three year period. So we see variety of contractual arrangements in place. Okay. And because these contractual arrangements are bargained for between the uh, lessor and the lessee, uh, and you have to evaluate all these terms based on contract based conditions, the market based conditions and asset related conditions. 
to get to a, an appropriate conclusion. As I said, more often than not, it's an easy conclusion, but in some scenario, uh, you know, the judgment uh, uh, requires a lot more caution, right? So let's just try and understand this um, with the help of an example, right? Uh, so in this example, um, entity ABC, um, entity ABC in a way enters into a lease uh, for equipment that includes a non-cancellable term of six years and a two-year fixed price renewal option with future lease payments that are intended to approximate market rates at lease inception. There are no termination penalties or other factors indicating that entity ABC is reasonably, reasonably certain to exercise the renewal option. So what's the non-cancellable period is six years at two renewal options and those renewal options are almost like uh, market price options and uh, there is no reason for us to believe that the ABC is reasonably certain to exercise the renewal option. Then what's the lease term, right? So what are the choice you're making? We have a six years uh, as the primary period, right? Uh, and, and then we have two renewal options. Right. Here, the, the fact pattern suggests that I am not reasonably certain, okay? So either way, if I'm not reasonably certain and I don't have any dis economic disincentive for me to exit out of this arrangement after six years, then essentially we are saying the lease term is six years, right? Um, so at the lease commencement date, uh, the lease term is six years, the renewal period of two years is not taken into consideration since it is mentioned that the entity ABC is not reasonably certain to exercise the option. Okay, let's look at another example, okay? So scenario B, Entity XYZ enters into a lease for a building that includes a non cancellable term of eight years, eight years. Here it is eight years, okay? Uh, and two year and a two year market priced renewal option. There's another two years uh, before it takes possession of the building. I'll get a possession of the building. Awesome. Uh, entity XYZ pays for leasehold improvements. I am also getting a leasehold improvement done. The leasehold improvements are expected to have significant value at the end of eight years. And that value can only be realized through continued occupancy of the lease property, right? So I've also, now there's an additional fact here that there is an additional, I've done significant amount of leasehold improvement before the lease commencement date, right? Um, and uh, the leasehold improvement are expected of significant value. So in a way, what it is trying to suggest that if you were to exit out of the lease arrangement after eight years, even though the next two year rents are market um, estimated rent, you will still suffer a loss because of the leasehold improvement you have to give up without utilizing that leasehold improvement. So there is an economic disincentive, right? From a lessee perspective, not to vacate the property if I have an option to continue for another two year period. So in a way, the answer here is likely to change, right? At the lease commencement, entity XYZ determines that it is reasonably certain to exercise the renewal option because it would suffer a significant economic penalty if it abandoned the leasehold improvement at the end of the initial non-cancellable period of eight years. Thus, at the lease commencement, entity XYZ concludes that the lease term is 10 years. That's what I was trying to say. The lease term here is 10 years. And that's the difference between our previous example and this example. In the previous example, there was no economic disincentive for me not to continue with the lease after the expiry of the non-cancellable period. Here, I have a significant economic disincentive so that my intention here possibly is going to be that I should continue. Otherwise, I'll suffer a loss. And hence, it makes uh, a reasonable choice to or reasonable sense, a commercial sense to conclude that the lease term here is 10 years. Okay, let's talk about uh, what's the meaning of a cancellable leases, right? 
a contract is defined as an agreement we, because we talked about the non cancellable lease right so a contract is defined as an agreement between two or more parties that create enforceable rights and obligation uh, agreement is not enforceable agreement is not considered to be enforceable if both the lessor and lessee each have the right to terminate the lease without permission from the other party you can terminate at will right with no more than an insignificant penalty so there is no penalty which is in a way is is levied even if there is something which is nominal so it doesn't matter uh, non cancellable period if only the lessor has the right to terminate means lessee cannot terminate the period covered by the option to terminate the lease is included in the non cancellable period of the lease from a lessee perspective because you are doing accounting from the lessee perspective if only the lessee has the right to terminate the lease then again you look at whether the lessee intends to uh, continue uh, that is then needs to be factored in in terms of your determination of the lease term right so uh, so let's let's just try and extend this with the help of an example uh, so suppose the term of a contract is 10 years and non cancellable or the lock in period is 6 years okay the lease term shall be as follows okay depending upon different scenarios so if the so 10 year is a is a contract term but it can be terminated after 6 years right that means there are renewal options right or extension options available under the contract so if the termination option is with the lessor after 6 years the termination option is with the lessor not the lessee then from a lessee perspective the lease term is 10 years okay if the termination option is with the lessee then the lessee has to make a decision that whether there is a significant disincentive to continue or not to continue right and basis which the lessee will determine so if the if the, the lease term shall be assuming reasonable certainty right if the because after the expiry of 6 year though the lease is not contractually bound till 10th year then it is assumed that lessee is reasonably certain that it will no more to exercise the option to so there is an element of judgment here there is an element of judgment okay now if the termination option is with both any party can terminate the lesser can terminate or the lessee can terminate if that been the case then the lease term is 6 years only right because even though i as lessee wants to renew the lessor may not want to renew right if the lessor want to continue the lessee may not want to continue so on and so forth right the lease term shall be 6 years in this example is 6 year here it is 10 years here also it is 10 years you know uh, from from that perspective so lease term is an important determination after 6 year either party can terminate without the consent of the party and hence the contract is not enforceable after 6 year only in case there is insignificant penalty for termination okay let's look at uh, the the significance of lease term and the related purchase option many times we see the purchase options are associated uh, uh, in many of the lease arrangements so the reassessment and revision of the lease term and purchase options so from a lessee perspective um, uh, you need to look at uh, reassess the lease term upon the occurrence of a significant event or a significant change in circumstances that is within the control of the lessee and affects whether the lessee is reasonably certain to exercise an option not previously included in determination of lease term or not to exercise an option previously included in this determination of the lease so basically if you have a purchase option then again this is another area of judgment which you need to consider that whether i'm going to exercise it i'm not going to exercise it now if at a point in let's originally you felt that you will not exercise it for x y z but if let's say this assessment changes at a point in time then that also results into a change uh, in your lease accounting right uh, revise the lease term if there is a change in the non cancellable period of a lease redetermine the lease term of a modified lease that is not accounted for as a separate lease uh, in a way from from that perspective so from a lessor perspective if there is a purchase option which is likely to get exercised why because it makes economic sense from a lessee perspective to exercise it there that means you will may get a different accounting right revise the lease term if there is a change in the non cancellable period uh, you know exercise an option not previously included in the lessor determination of the lease term from that from that perspective okay 
So now we will talk about certain recognition exemptions. So now we've talked about the lease term, uh, we've talked about non cancellable leases, uh, non cancellable leases. Uh, I know whether the cancellable option is in the hand of the lessor or the lessee or with both parties, how does that impact the determination of the lease term? All of that is what we have picked up and talked about, right? Uh, now let's talk about the recognition exemption. What are some of the practical expedients available uh, under the standard? So a lessee can elect, okay? A lessee can elect not to apply India's 116 recognition requirement to a short term lease. Short term lease means what? Something which is less than 12 months. Short term lease is less than 12 months. Okay. Um, let's see, lease for which the underlying asset is of low value. Now, low value is not defined, right? It's again an area of judgment. For lease with a lease term of 12 months or less, lessee can make an accounting policy election by class of underlying asset to use the short term lease exemption, not to recognize lease asset or liability on the balance sheet, to recognize lease expense on a straight line or another systematic basis. All right. As the determination is made at the commencement date, a lease cannot be classified as short term if the lease term is subsequently reduced to less than 12 months. So let's say you made you made an assessment that it will continue for beyond 12 months and basis which you've done the accounting subsequently there is a change in the term then that's the lease modification and you need to then appropriately apply the modification accounting and we will again talk how do you apply the modification accounting okay. So and let's say if there are 11 month leases we see uh, and then the renewal options. So if there are renewal options which are likely to be exercised, uh, you know, then there are again, not a short term lease. If the exercise option is not reasonably certain, then of course it's a short term lease. So again, you got to look at the uh, facts and circumstances and some judgment um, uh, in a way are involved. Let's, let's just try and uh, uh, understand this um, in a way with the help of an example, right? Um, a lessee, enters into a lease with a nine month non cancellable term with an option to extend the lease for four months. Okay. The lease does not have a purchase option at the lease commencement date. The lessee is reasonably certain to exercise the extension because the monthly lease payment during the extension period are significantly below the market period. Okay. Then the question is whether the lessee can take a short term exemption in accordance with INDAS 116. Okay. Now the answer here is that no, you cannot because it's a 13 month, you know, as the lease is reasonably certain, lessee is reasonably certain to exercise the extension option. The lease term is greater than 12 months. Therefore, the lessee will not account for the lease as a short term lease. Okay. Uh, low value. Okay. What is the meaning of low value? Election for leases for which the underlying asset is of low value can be made again on a lease by lease basis. No threshold has been prescribed in the standard to determine the classification as low value. What conditions you need to satisfy? The lessee can benefit from use of the underlying asset on its own or together with other resources. Uh, underlying asset is not highly dependent on or highly integrated. That means you're not going to combine it. So you can't say, uh, you know, in a, in a car, you have a tire, which is independent, or a chassis, which is independent, or so on and so forth. So um, uh, from, from that perspective, uh, the exemption for leases of low value item intends to capture leases that are high in volume, but low in value, right? Example, lease of small IT equipment like laptops, mobile phones, printers, simple printers, office furniture, et cetera, where you don't want to go through the administrative hassle of capturing all the details and capitalizing. But if the, if the combined value is material, significant, then again, uh, we're seeing in practice that you know, companies are capitalizing all of them. And then what is low value is again a matter of judgment low value is matter of judgment okay so now let's talk about lease payment okay let's talk about lease payments so we've talked about many things right all these concepts we've been trying to talk about is important for you to remember and important for you to understand um, and and uh, we should uh, circle back you know if you are not clear on any of these component uh, concepts go back uh, you know, understand it and then, you know, you know, try and understand the new concepts important for you to be clear on all these concepts, right? 
Uh, so when it comes to uh, the lease payments, right? Um, the lease payments are defined as payments made by a lessor to a lessee uh, relating the right to use an underlying asset during the lease term. Uh, many times you see you you call it by different names doesn't matter till the time you're using it paying it for the use of the asset right uh fixed payments including in substance fixed payment less any lease incentive so if you if the lessor is paying you anything you got to reduce it from the payment you will make to let's see uh less for uh so fixed payment variable payments uh, which are dependent on an index or rate exercise price of a purchase option payment for penalties for terminating the lease and residual value guarantee right all of this in a way so any fixed payment the variable payment the payment for purchase exercise or purchase option which you're likely to exercise if you're not likely to exercise then i will not include it right the residual value guarantee uh if the any penalty for uh, termination uh you know all of that are in a way akin to lease payment what is not included uh they do not include payments allocated to the non-lease component like the maintenance we talked about unless the lessee elect to combine the non lease component with the lease component and to account for them as a single lease component the variable lease payment that do not depend on an index or a rate like contingent rentals then you account for them on an as and when basis right and and then you simply charge it to the pnl like a normal expense uh, you know which you do otherwise but with the variable lease payment linked to an index or a uh, or a rate then you actually uh, you know capitalize them as well right uh, or we, assuming it's an observable uh, index uh, in a way from from that perspective so um talking about um uh, the uh, lease um, uh, incentives right uh, when you think about the lease incentive is less basically uh, the lessor uh, is compensating the lessee uh, for the use of the asset uh, in terms of to promote the use of the asset let's say you have to do a lease or improvement and uh, lessor may give you an advance to do the lease or improvement and then in a way that money gets recovered through the lease rent right nothing is free nothing is free uh, from a commercial uh, contract perspective so lease incentives are defined as payments made by a lessor to a lessee associated with the lease or the reimbursement or assumption by lessor of cost of a lessee these might include uh, incentives for the lessee to sign the lease such as upfront cash payment to the lessee payment of cost uh, for the lessee which is moving cost transportation cost or the assumption by the lessor of the lessee pre existing lease with a third party uh, lease incentive that are paid or payable uh, lease that are paid or payable to the lessee by the lessor are deductible from lease payment and reduce the initial measurement of the right of use asset right so uh, from a lessor perspective the lease incentives are also deducted uh, from lease payment so they don't get to you do, you not record this as an expense and record a higher income right so it gets adjusted from your lease payments uh depending upon the lease classification uh for finance lease uh, lease incentives that are payable to the lessee reduce the expected lease receivable at the commencement date and thereby uh the initial measurement of the lessor net investment in the lease consequently the profit or loss is <coughs> not affected sorry uh so consequently uh the profit or loss is not affected for operating leases <coughs> for operating leases uh the lessor should defer the cost of any lease incentives paid or payable to the lessee and recognize that cost as a reduction to lease income over the lease term so again i said from a lessor perspective if you made an advance it's like making an advance payment against which you're receiving the uh, lease rental so you will adjust it from the rental you will not treat the money which you paid to the lessee as an expense and then record the higher amount as an income so uh, uh, so it's important uh, in a way uh, for you to understand uh, the lease incentives are nothing but uh, in a way uh, you know incentivizing the lessee to get into the contract uh, and uh, and hence whatever consideration you re you receive from the lessee for the purpose of the um, uh, contract needs to be adjusted appropriately or accounted appropriately uh, in a way from that perspective both from the lessee and the lessor uh, perspective 